Mm -hmm. All right, welcome everybody, and thank you very much for attending today. So my name is Elizabeth Savalko, and I work at the University of Iowa in our graduate fellowships and careers advising office. And in that capacity, which I've been in since September 2014, I've been working with graduate students both in STEM disciplines on STEM field fellowships, such as through NIH and NSF, but also working with students across disciplines and also with STEM students on on applications for fellowships that are open to STEM students, but not necessarily exclusively so. So things like the Ford Foundation or American Association of University Women are some of the ones that will be, I'll be briefly giving an overview of today. And um, so to get started on today's topic, because our focus is going to be a little bit of an a typical topic for several presentations in the sense that it's focusing more on broad pictures of how your participation in CERTL, how you're learning and implementing about the teaching and research approach can be used to strengthen your status as a fellowship applicant, um, whether it be by ways of discussing your career preparation or positive outcomes that you're producing for others, I'm going to go ahead and get started with asking all of you who are here today to share a little bit of qualitative, excuse me, quantitative first and then qualitative data about how much prior experience you've had with fellowships. And so there should be a poll popping up here um, where if you select A, B, or C, um, you can select if you've had prior experience applying for a fellowship before. And just for clarification, while people are looking for um, the poll response options, um, fellowships would typically be awards that are primarily providing you a stipend in contrast to a grant that would be more for the supplies that you would be doing uh, for a research project. Um, so if you're joining us on a mobile device and you are not able to use the poll option, um, you can also chime in in the chat window with A, B, or C if that works better for you. Okay. And we want to give some people a bit of time to ensure they have a chance to find their responses. Yeah, and just as a reminder, um, the poll options are right below your name in the participants panel. And there you should you can select the drop down of the A, and that will uh, let you choose your option A, B, or C. Thanks. Okay, we uh, see for some of our results coming in so far, it's looking like B is currently one of the most frequently reported answers here. But we also have um, some people who have responded A, both through the poll and also through the chat window. Thank you very much. Um, so we still have about 40 seconds left on our timer. So um, also, uh, thank you. Uh, we have another response just came in here for A in the chat window. Um, so as people are finishing up their responses, um, for also some context as we go through the presentation and the interactions today, there will be some periods where um, we're pausing, we'll pause to be able to catch up with any questions that people have along the way. Um, you can either um, chime in in the chat window if that works better for you, um, or if you would rather save them until we're at one of our three transition points, that will also work really well too. Okay, so. Um, our timer is up here, and our moderator today, Dr. Aaron Barnes, also from the University of Iowa, has just posted the responses. So it looks like a pretty even spread of, of people who have answered today, leaning a little bit more toward being um, relatively new to the world of fellowships. So including uh, the three people from the chat window who have answered A. So um, eight people have not applied, uh, six have applied for one or two awards, and three have applied for three or more awards. And so um, this helps to, us to get a sense of um, the level of familiarity. Um, the topics we'll be going through today will uh, hopefully be a pretty versatile introduction to both topics as well as going into some of the more specifics of ways that CERTL and the teaching as research approach can be incorporated. And uh, here comes the qualitative part of it, just because there are so many different dimensions to the talk and our scope is going to be a broad picture overview, um, 
if there are any initial aspects that people would like to share about what most drew you to attend today's event, this would be sort of analogous to if we were having an in-person one-on-one funding consultation where I'd be asking um, if people were having a particular fellowship in mind, if they were most interested in the search strategies, um, if basically all the topics were roughly equal in interest. Um, and so if there are any particular things that people would like to share, this can help us adapt to make sure that any topics um, that of particular interest that we're able to come back to those. Okay, and just as a reminder, yeah, for those of you who missed the technical introduction, there's a um, tool panel on the left-hand side of the slides, and the fourth button down is the text box button. And if you click on that, that'll let you write directly onto the slides. Thank you. Okay, and so uh, so thank you for our first response coming in. Um, so having some prior experience with university fellowships, looking to expand at external ones. So um, we'll definitely be going over some strategies to look for um, that you can use for looking for multiple different types of external fellowship options. Um, two people uh, have chimed in so far for career preparation. Um, we're definitely going to be talking about that and also um, getting some interactive brainstorming from the group as a whole today. Um, so it looks like some of our other responses here, um, ways to incorporate um, early career fellowships into applying for the job market. Um, and then, Okay, and so looking for funding to um, expand outside of specific of field specific fellowships. Um, you know, again, looking for stipend support, um, being better resource for supporting students, um, and additional funding specifically for the TAR project. Great. Um, let's see. Okay, and then also it looks like from the chat window we have some people, um, you know, another, you know, interested in knowing how the process works as a whole, previous experience in um, research funding and summer funding. Okay, great. Thank you everybody for sharing so far. So broadly speaking, it looks like the group as a whole is pretty interested in the career aspects and also the um, external and expanding into a broader range of uh, fellowship opportunities. So, um, so this is good. So we'll be um, covering a lot of these topics here, but this is helpful to confirm and be able to adapt as needed. So great. So uh, thank you very much, everybody, for chiming in here. So now that our timer has gone off, uh, let's continue into the main portion of the event today. So the three major topics we'll be covering are all focused on different aspects that are all related to the broader big picture of thinking about different fellowship opportunities, ways that we can recognize different organizations that might align well with uh, applicants who are doing CERTL training and are familiar and learning how to implement teaching as research projects, as well as given the different ways in which that alignment could occur, what are some strategies that one can have in mind for both finding new opportunities and also for um, getting started and thinking through how and where you might be incorporating your CERTL training. So just to clarify, um, uh, the scope of today's event is going to be more big picture brainstorming rather than specifically writing process focused, but we're happy to take any questions or have any discussion um, if there are any uh, follow-up topics related to that in any of our uh, plus points, which we'll be having um, after each of the three main, main transitions here. All right, so starting off with topic one, which is ways in which CERTL and the teaching as research approach can align with different external funding organizations. And even though um, 
the focus here is primarily going to be undergraduate students. Um, most of these concepts also apply for postdocs as well. And many of these example organizations I'll talk through have funding opportunities for people at all stages of their academic development. So grad current graduate students, uh, current postdocs, if you're planning to go a faculty route, there can also be ones at the faculty stage. So a helpful way to think about any sort of funding opportunity is that there always has to be overlap between what you're trying to accomplish and what a given organization is trying to accomplish. And so sometimes this overlap can be relatively direct. So it could be, say, NIH wants to fund biomedical research. You're doing biomedical research. That could be an area of overlap. However, in practice, most of the different types of external funding agencies can draw upon multiple aspects of who you are and what you're doing. So one organization may care primarily about your research. Another may care about a holistic synthesis of your research, your teaching, community outreach. And the premise of today is that to highlight organizations that um, even though there is going to be conceptual overlap of where CERTL can be, and your CERTL training can be relevant to all of them, uh, there can also be different considerations and different ways in which they're relevant to each organization. And probably the number one most critical thing to keep in mind about any funding application is that you always want to adapt your approach to make sure you're being responsive to that particular organization. So. Um, how much and in what way you're presenting your circle work in context of everything else that you're doing um, as a scholar. So in this section, I'm going to be going through four representative example funding organizations. And um, after this point, we'll be having a, a section where um, if there are any of them that are particularly resonating with you of this is something I have applied for, this is something I definitely am planning to apply for, um, here's something I've never heard of but I'm interested, um, we'll be at, that'll be a place for people to chime in later. So if you can keep that sort of uh, upcoming activity in mind, um, that will be helpful for that next section. Okay. So the first of the four organizations I'll highlight is the National Science Foundation, NSF, which is very focused on funding basic science research, translational work that is not medical in nature, uh, social sciences, and also a pretty strong focus on STEM education. And uh, NSF provides a lot of the funding for CERTL. And so that, in part, is why there is a lot of room for conceptual overlap between uh, the CERTL goals of being more effective in STEM instruction, uh, professional training as a STEM educator, um, that aligns with one of the major ways in which NSF sees uh, people making what are called broader impacts. Um, there also can be overlap with other dimensions of CERTL in addition to uh, teaching his research, the uh, learning through diversity. Um, NSF has a very strong approach toward any sort of practices that are increasing uh, the diversity of the people participating in STEM, ensuring that there's very inclusive teaching practices going on. And then another sort of subtle connection is that a lot of broader impacts activities can involve community outreach and education. And the format of them can vary depending on whether you're applying for or like a graduate research uh, fellowship, which is for early career graduate students in uh, year one or year two of your program where they would like to hear about longer term types of broader impacts, community outreach you might have, um, that can give flexibility where they like, where there are many types of activities you can plan, but they really like to see that you have tangible plans in place for what are you specifically going to do, what, how will you know that you're effective at making these beneficial outcomes to people. And so that can be a way where, because teaching is research is all about planning your events and activities in a way such that you are going to be learn at keeping track, having ways that you're measuring, was this effective or not? What are the differences in um, different approaches that were taken? How do we know whether you succeeded in your goal? That sort of training can be utilized as part 
of your training proposal, as well as helping to demonstrate things like having a strong commitment to STEM education. Um, as a note, over here in the example award section, um, as Denise commented in the chat window, the links are not going to be currently active here in Blackboard, but the distribution version that will be on the website, I would strongly encourage you to explore some of these programs that are, whether at the graduate student stage, at the postdoc stage, or if you're thinking long term for becoming a faculty member at some point, there are also um, a few there as well. So moving on to the second example I'm highlighting here. Um, the Ford Foundation is another organization that has a really high priority on preparing future college and university faculty. And specifically, they're looking for faculty members who are going to be helping to increase the representation among uh, college and university professors who are from ethnically or racially uh, underrepresented groups historically. And also, but in addition to that, faculty members who are going to be very involved in effective teaching for students. Again, both effective teaching as a whole and also inclusive teaching practices. And so Ford Foundation fellowships um, are not specific to STEM fields, although most STEM fields are in scope, save for a few very clinical public, public health, nursing, dual degree programs. And so this is another example where um, the organization as a whole has this really heavy evidence, uh, excuse me, really heavy emphasis on specifically college and teaching practices. So a third of, the third of the four organizations I'll highlight is American Association of University Women, which is conceptually similar to the Ford Foundation in that it's open across all disciplines uh, for most of their awards. There are a few exceptions, such as in their um, Selected Professions Award for specific types of uh, master's programs. And their premise is providing financial support to women scholars and also for different programs that are involved in making the lives of women and girls better in the world in some ways. And they have a really wide range of ways in which they define this. And so this can include STEM education as, uh, in particular. Um, it can also include, say, for example, if one of the areas in which you're interested in investigating are effective teaching practices across genders, for example, um, teaching practices in, say, education, women, excuse me, teaching practices for women in engineering, um, for example. Um, and so even though their primary criterion for their fellowships is scholarly excellence, they do have sections in their applications where they specifically ask you to describe your teaching experience and uh, giving evidence and discussing ways in which you're using teaching to help make a positive difference in the world in some ways. And so um, this is, this from AUW and the Ford Foundation, these are two examples of organizations open to students across disciplines, but are also having these really strong elements of education and outreach related goals. Now the fourth one I want to mention can probably come as a bit of, might come as a bit of a surprise to many people, but I want to mention it just because the National Institutes of Health, NIH, is one of the the most major funding organizations for uh, biomedical research in the U.S. And um, to make sure that everyone's clear on the context, NIH deservedly does have a reputation for being a research-focused organization. So if you are applying for an individual fellowship as a graduate student or postdoc or a career development award as a postdoc or early career faculty member, you do need to strongly convey that your long-term goals are going to be including and heavily focused on continuing to do biomedical research. Now, that said, both of these types of awards, the individual fellowships, the career development awards, are based on the idea that you are making a case for what sort of training you as an individual are going to do for the particular type of research-related career you're doing. So if you're planning for a faculty career, um, the section where you have up to six pages to summarize your previous research, to um, describe in very great detail what are you going to do during the, uh, during the funded period to help you 
prepare for your career goals. And so if your future career will involve teaching, it's absolutely relevant to be able to include certal and teaching related work as one component of the holistic whole of your application. And so just to finish up uh, the big takeaway messages from these four examples, um, two of the major themes that can sometimes emerge can be certal teaching related training, the teaching as research approach can be a way of addressing positive outcomes that you're creating for other people by the act of teaching others, by the act of doing outreach, and it can also be related to your own professional training, preparing you as an individual to be better placed to the next stage that you're going to be taking in. Now there can be overlap, especially if the career you're thinking of would also involve making positive outcomes for others, but this sort of framework of benefits to others, benefits for you, is something we'll be coming back to. Okay, so I've been talking for a bit, so now this could be our point to help um, uh, share some day people's thoughts about if there are any organizations that really resonated with you, especially since we have a lot of people who have not previously applied for fellowships, um, sharing your thoughts about what's involved in recognizing this might be in scope. Um, alternatively, if none of these examples really struck you, um, that's also okay to share too, and we might be able to help discuss uh, some of the possible barriers and questions. Um, so we should be having a timer, I believe, pop up here in a bit for any sharing. Um, and so while people are initially thinking, I saw that we had a question come in related to uh, which fellowships have a nationality restriction. And that is an extremely important question, especially in STEM fields and especially at the graduate student and postdoc stage. So of the examples that I listed, um, NIH, NSF, and the Ford Foundation, most of their awards do have, are, are specifically for people who are US citizens, US nationals, or US permanent residents. Now, one exception to that with uh, NSF are their doctoral dissertation improvement grants. Those are not, uh, those are open to any graduate students who are at a US institution. And so even though most of NSF funding is uh, specific to US citizens, then that one, the doctoral dissertation improvement grants are not. Um, AUW is also one that is it depends on the award. So some of their awards are for U.S. citizens. Uh, some of them are for international scholars. Um, so broadly speaking, there will be a greater chance of organizations not having uh, citizenship as an eligibility criterion. Anything that's more nonprofit related, um, American Heart Association, for example, they tend to be more um, uh, not necessarily consistently having uh, citizenship as a criterion. So uh, thank you very much for asking, Wilson. Okay. All right. And so, um, so for the comments that people have made up here, so uh, one person has uh, mentioned AEUW. That sounds like a very good alignment with the vision for their future research. Um, there are two people asking about HHMI. So uh, the Howard Hughes Medical Institute is another very research focused institution. And so um, in the experiences that we ha have had with students looking at HHMI fellowships once, they have a, they are going to be generally very research oriented. And so um, that would be conceptually a bit more similar to the NIH scenario where they would want your primary impression of your career goals to be more research focused. But um, if there are places for describing your long-term career goals, if you're thinking for like a faculty approach, um, the teaching could definitely be included as one component of your holistic preparation. Okay. So um, thank you very much for people who are chiming in. Um, so people have also mentioned um, professional development for additional um, USDA, NIFA, AFRI fellowships. Um, and um, now that said, and also from the uh, chat window, it looks like uh, somebody else has chimed in that um, 
these examples just don't seem to currently align with your particular TAR project's current focus. And that is relating to another big question for uh, how to approach funding. So that Venn diagram that we looked at before, um, the ways in which there can be an overlap are going to be very project specific. And so depending on the type of project that you have, any sort of interdisciplinary connections, um, community impacts, a lot of that can vary um, depending on the particular approach you're taking. Okay, so we have another question that came in here um, about can we apply to professional societies or organizations for teaching in a certain discipline? So um, professional societies and organizations are another really good uh, place to look for field-specific opportunities. Um, that said, a lot of times uh, professional societies, many of them tend to lean a little bit more toward like conference travel funding or smaller scale grant awards. That said, a small scale grant award of even if it's like $1,000, that could do a lot if you're thinking in terms of having, like say, a teaching as research project, if you just need a little bit of money to say compensate participants for a qualitative research uh, component. Um, that said, there are also some professional societies that also may offer specific fellowships. So they are definitely another good resource to look into. Oh, yes, and specifically connecting them relating to professional development. We see the uh, pointing arrow coming up here. Um, okay, and the other question coming in here is, um, are there any funds uh, that we can apply for a CERTL project? So um, some of that is going to be more institution specific. So sometimes if you're at an organization, there may be internal grants. Um, another approach can also be if you're at an institution that offers small scale um, awards for graduate students for any sort of professional development or small scale projects, um, depending on what you're thinking of for your particular CERTL project, um, especially if it's starting local, checking for smaller scale awards can be another option in addition to these really large scale fellowships. Okay, so, um, okay, and it also looks like um, Denise has chimed in to clarify that, it, again, that it's mostly individual CERTL institution based ones rather than through the National CERTL Network. Okay, so thank you very much everybody for chiming in here and sharing uh, your discussion here. So we'll be coming back to some of these approaches of how and where to look for these organizations in the third segment. But for now, we're going to go into the middle section here, which is about, say that you are looking into a new organization, where do you begin to look for the most useful information? What are some of the example ways that you might potentially incorporate your CERTL um, training, a specific teaching and research project, and then some tips for, depending on the approach you're taking, to adapt that proposal. So for any fellowship that you're applying for, since the things that each organization can care about can be very different, it's always very important to start with the directions for that specific fellowship. So sometimes there can be discourse along the idea of once you have your proposal, you just change the page limit and send it everywhere. And in practice, looking for more subtle differences, checking the evaluation criteria, um, customizing your proposal as much as you can for each individual organization usually will be much more effective in making that close match. Um, and so for the slides I'm going to be using, I'm just picking NSF as an example. Um, and so in addition to reading the specific directions, which oftentimes are very clear, other times you may wonder, well, we get that we want to benefit society as a whole, but you know, in concrete terms, what might that look like? And so looking around on an organization's website for internal documents, so for NSF in 2014, they had a summit between NSF and faculty members funded through them for discussing different types of broader impacts. And the document itself, I linked to it since it's about eight pages, so a good balance of relatively brief, but yet long enough to give some depth on what are some ways in which faculty members are doing broader impacts, including some teaching related examples. And another source for getting more of that broader context of, well, what ways in which, what ways does this organization really care about? What ways do they see teaching as a connection? 
many of them are on social media. So the type of things that they officially tweet or post, uh, the sort of things that they repost, this can help give demonstrations of things that people have done through, say, NSF funding. Uh, the Ford Foundation at one point uh, had a Storify account of all the tweets people had posted at one of their conferences for fellows. And so social media can be a good way to sort of fill in and get more tangible examples of what an organization is doing. And if you reach a point at which looking online just doesn't help, it's also okay to reach out to an organization. So um, they usually will have questions where uh, a place where you can contact them if you have questions. And then also, if there's anybody in your home department or anybody you've met through professional organizations that has some experience with a given organization, that can it can be a good way to simultaneously get clarification and also advice from somebody who may have applied or may have know, know somebody else who has. And so for um, this point here, so say that we have looked at a funding organization's page and hypothetically, let's say that they are extremely interested in hearing about your teaching and teaching is research and CERTL specifically in ways that it relates to you making positive outcomes for others. And so this section, we're going to be having a timer pop up to basically have this be a more interactive brainstorming session. And so um, whether this be students that you are working with, whether it be people in your professional network, um, the first, any sort of thing that comes to mind. If you could share that on the whiteboard, please. Okay, great. So I'll, it looks like we're having some results coming in already. <laughs> okay, so um, yep, so we have developing content for the discipline. So the results that you are uh, developing and learning about, helping to, um, you know, helping contribute to the broader field as a whole, um, helping your institution be better at what it's doing, um, employment, especially if you're interested in a career that is directly involving you continuing to help others, such as through teaching or outreach. Um, yep, and again, um, so positive outcomes for engaging people at the student level, um, learning more about how science is actually done, um, developing more effective methods. Um, let's see, and then, um, yep, and a lot of these topics here, in addition to the ones that you're brainstorming, um, discussing your project with particular professors um, or um, other people who also have the similar sort of interest in teaching innovations, teaching methods, that can be a great way to expand what everybody's collectively doing. Um, yep, again, better teaching practices, um, specifically related to student retention, emotional attachment, um, effective peer and self-assessment, um, and then also learning more about career options, expanding your network. So, Great, thank you very much everybody for contributing. And this is helping to show in this group brainstorming session a lot of the major dimensions of outcomes for others, whether it's related to uh, direct impacts on the students that you work with, whether it be longer term down the line by you contributing to and learning from mutually expanding the range of people in the discipline and nationally who also are helping to make more effective teaching. So uh, thank you very much, everybody, for sharing. And we'll be coming back to um, a similar type of exercise in just two slides for things for your own individual career development. OK, so see that for this outcomes-based focus, there are four major types of big picture things that can be helpful to keep in mind at this early stage. And this is again going to be one of these stages where, because it is more big picture, um, these are more big picture strategies. And so one can be, out of all of those great benefits that the group brainstormed today, um, starting with which ones to focus on. And so um, oftentimes, 
there will be a decision of, well, do I just list everything or do I pick a few representative examples? Um, sometimes you can get really clear-cut outcomes such as American Association of Women, you would definitely want to focus on questions of uh, gender and teaching in STEM. But in other cases, it might be more of a question where you know anything could potentially work. And so in general, for those cases, um, what I would advise people is that even though it can be tempting to list every single possible benefit, um, the risk of that is that your reviewers won't necessarily be able to get a clear picture of what type of impact you have when you really dig into um, a particular project. And so having a balance of one representative example, say if there's a particular dimension you've most focused on, whether it be here's the particular teaching and research project that you did, um, here was what you found, here was how you disseminated it, using that as one detailed example can help your reviewers get a sense of, okay, well, if you were able to do that in this setting, it's easier for them to extrapolate some of the other ways in which you might apply it in the future. And then the other two considerations are also related. And so um, see if you were writing about your research in a fellowship or a grant proposal, one common cons consideration and complication is that your reviewers won't necessarily be experts in your same subject field. Sometimes they will be, but other times they may be from a much different discipline. And this is especially true for things like um, Ford Foundation or AEUW, awards that are open across disciplines as a whole and are not STEM specific. But this can also be a case for within, say, NSF as well. So if you're applying for funding through cultural anthropology, you might re be reviewed by anybody from cultural anthropology, even if their topic is completely different from yours within that field. And so the reason that I discuss this in the research context first is that the same concept can also apply to talking about teaching related outcomes. So a lot of this depends on the audience you're writing to. So if they're already prioritizing STEM education is really essential, we really have a need to improve uh, the quality of STEM education, the participation of students in STEM, you might not need as much explicit context to establish that baseline level. On the other hand, if it's for a very general audience that's open to uh, grant applications from any sort of subject, or say if you are taking an approach where, um, let's see, no, actually I think the examples that we talked about about some of those smaller scale awards, that might be more helpful to think of here. So say if it were like say a graduate student government organization providing small scale funding awards for students to do any sort of project as long as you can make a good case for why it's important, for a setting like that, then you might have to be more direct and explicit about establishing things like here is the current state of STEM education, here are are areas where there are specific problems, here is why this is needed. And so how much background information to give, how direct and blunt you need to be about why your project matters, um, why the way you're doing it is going to benefit you. Um, if you're thinking of it more in terms of um, outcomes for others by disseminating your work to other audiences, um, including context for, say, if you're going to present your teaching and research results at a given conference, making a case in your proposal for, well, who's going to be at that conference? Um, what are their backgrounds? Why would they be interested in hearing about this? What are ways that your sharing this information would be beneficial to them? Um, and uh, let's see, so, and it looks like um, there's a question that just popped up in the chat window about, uh, would philanthropic organizations support teaching development? Um, a lot of that would depend on the individual organization. And so um, some organizations, if the way that they conceive of um, their approach to philanthropy includes education, um, or say if, for example, they're very open-ended about just make a good case for why you're doing this would help people, that might be a viable approach. Um, in practice, a lot of organizations do tend to more specifically define the way in which they are looking at people to do activities. And so a lot of that would depend on the organization itself. Uh, thank you for asking that. 
And so the last tip to keep in mind is our one foray into more specific writing style strategy. And when you are describing the benefits of your outcomes, you would want to take the sort of approach that we started on the brainstorming slide where you're giving these very specific examples. Ultimately, what you want to avoid can be sometimes a tendency to say, um, by doing this activity, it will be beneficial for the community. And stopping there, rather than having that be the starting point for further elaboration. And so um, any sort of discussion about you know, why is this project going to matter, why is your um, involvement going to be beneficial to people, you always want to have the because in there to give those specific examples. And so that was why we built in the brainstorming section so that people can have more of a chance to get used to thinking up and articulating those benefits. Okay, and so with that, um, we're going to take a few minutes here to give another exercise for the career benefits approach of CERTL and the teaching as research approach. And so um, a lot of people especially were interested in the career benefits here. And so um, this is another, going to be another whiteboard activity where, say, if you're applying for ones like, say, NIH or uh, some of these other career development fellowships, where rather than focusing on ways that you're benefiting others, what are some ways that learning about teaching practices, being competent in the teaching as research approach, are going to make you a better professional for the directions you're going in? Okay, so um, for our results coming in so far, so um, again, we're having the approach of by you developing more experience and different methodologies, um, making you more versatile as um, an instructor, as a researcher. Um, let's see, and yes, again, if you're good at teaching, um, you know, again, the sort of question of um, you know, both being effective and if students are satisfied, um, that combination together of both learning things and also being satisfied, you know, potentially that could have good evaluations. Um, uh, let's see, um, again, coming in with the idea of reviewers, you know, seeing that really from commitment to uh, training and preparation for faculty positions, uh, these two sort of um, hitting at the same idea, really commitment, uh, commitment to teaching. And then also, again, this really tangible demonstration of doing a teaching as research project. Um, that is whether, um, whether it is specifically through uh, demonstrating innovation or ways that you are benefiting the university community. Again, coming back to this idea of that synthesis of both your own career development being a way by which you're making positive impacts for others. Um, and so uh, these are all really great responses here. Um, so the one additional area that I would also just like to briefly mention here too is that um, some of the things that were mentioned earlier about disseminating your results, participating in a professional network of, of scholars, of uh, both giving and sharing updates on the methods you're developing, that in itself is also another type of career benefit because it's developing your range of participation in the scholarly community. So um, again, that is sort of showing ways in which the outcomes for others and the career benefits for you do definitely have some overlap. But thinking about them as from the starting point perspective can help in terms of possible tangible approaches you might take. Okay.
And so I'm going to go pretty quickly through this slide because it's essentially reiterating that if you're writing about the career benefits of what you're doing, you still are facing the same four fundamental questions. And so these are the exact same four topics as before, basically just remembering that all of these core good grant writing principles of picking which examples are going to be best demonstrating your areas of expertise, establishing context as needed, always following up with the explanations of why is this going to be beneficial for your career, establishing context, what are your goals, what are alternative training methods. Um, to basically take these core good principles of grant writing um, and also make sure that you're applying them to your discussion of your careers in addition to research focus. So um, we are at 115, but I do want to make sure that anybody has a chance to ask any questions about, um, since we're taking this broader overview approach, if there's any additional information that we can give that can help you feel more prepared to take these broader concepts and be comfortable putting them into practice. And any other questions are also okay too. Okay. So question of, is there anything else I can do to make myself competitive for these fellowships? So a lot of these fellowships, if they are looking for say outcomes for others, a lot of them like to see a good track record and a long-term commitment to making those types of positive outcomes. And so if you're relatively early in your program or even if you aren't relatively early in your program, getting started in um, whether it's a specific teaching and research project, um, if it is related to um, you know, working with another outreach group on campus, if you're applying your approach to outreach activities, um, having that sort of involvement is going to be um, key for building up your prior track record. A lot of these organizations also do look at having a clear plan for your research. And so, um, again, a lot of this would depend on what stage you're at in your program. And so, if you're relatively early on in your program, um, making sure that you have a really clear idea for a potential project planned out, um, backup plans, um, um, things like that. If you are later in your program, uh, publications submitted or in preparation, um, those are, the later that you get, that can be another major consideration that reviewers will look at. Um, but a lot of this will depend on the individual fellowship, but in general, that combination of being good in both your research, but then also having a tangible set of activities and projects that you're doing related to teaching or outreach that's related to teaching, that sort of balance can be a good holistic preparation that can be easily adapted to different fellowship audiences. So it can be the same type of activities that are just presented in slightly different ways for different audiences. So thank you for asking. And I want to be sure we also get a chance to talk about simplifying the project to minimize IRB concerns but still adding scholarly value. Um, so a lot of that is going to depend on the specifics of your IRB review process. Um, and also with the timeline of your given project. Um, so um, Aaron, our moderator, is our teaching his research uh, uh, coordinator as, long as, as well as our CERTL coordinator at the University of Iowa, and she works more directly with students on planning teaching his research projects. Um, Aaron, would you like to uh, comment briefly on that? Sure. So here at the University of Iowa, and I'm not sure how it works from campus to campus, we have what's called an HRSD human subject research determination form. So when you fill that out, you get valuable feedback about whether or not you need to progress to the next level, the full level of review. So um, depending on whether or not your results are generalizable really influences the level, the extent to which it'll have to go to full, full review. So here at Iowa, filling out that form will give you a really good idea about the type of hurdles um, that you may have to go through in order to uh, complete your research. Okay, thank you, Erin, for clarifying. Okay, so, um, and again, if you have additional questions on that, feel free to ask in the chat window and one of us can follow up with you further um, on that. 
All right, so in the last 10 minutes, um, we're going to be proceeding into the, our last section of strategies to be able to find additional types of funding opportunities. And um, just to recapitulate some of the things that people have already been asking about, when you're thinking for funding, a lot of the earlier sections were focused most on large-scale external fellowships providing stipend support from outside funding agencies such as NSF, AAUW, the Ford Foundation. There can also be larger scale research grants, but not all grants necessarily have to be large. So some of the things that people had already asked about, um, things like uh, small scale grants, having resources to do a teaching as research project. Um, if you are looking for travel grants to present your teaching as research results to uh, an audience, especially if you're looking to transition to the scholar stage. And, um, Basically, especially for a lot of these smaller scale projects, um, internal funding can oftentimes be a good way to look for, pro for funding that may be smaller in scope, but it might be exactly the right type of amount that you need. And also, because a lot of it is um, going to be specific to your institution, there may be a smaller competitor pool. And so the next three slides, I'll be discussing three broad types of strategies to look for funding that can be related to, that the diffusing combination can work pretty well to help you search for both the large scale, the small scale, internal and external. So the first of the three strategies are online funding search databases. And in general, these are databases that are specifically listing different types of funding opportunities. And they usually will allow you to search by keyword filters, um, by subject discipline, and also to sort out, say, for example, uh, awards only for graduate students, or say, only for postdocs, depending on the career stage. And there are many different databases that exist. So uh, the six listed up here are not the only ones, but they're a good representative example of different interfaces. Um, some are keyword-based, some are pre-compiled lists. And these websites tend to work better than just a general search engine because many of them pre-compile eligibility information. And it helps give you a bit more structure if you don't necessarily know um, the particular ter um, term that you're looking for using a more general one or even if you pick the option of just show me everything in the social sciences, for example. And these are a really, really powerful database, uh, excuse me, really, really powerful tool to use. The main caution that I would give everyone is to not assume that these are comprehensive or that they're listing every single funding opportunity that exists. In general, these databases tend to prioritize the larger scale funding. And so things that are like, say, a few hundred dollars for travel grants, institution specific, very subject specific, these are often less likely to be listed in these databases. Similarly, because they are all curated by different people, unfortunately, none of them are comprehensive. So in the searches that I've done uh, comparing some of these databases, in general, about half of the things you find will be cross-referenced in more than one, but the other half tend to be database specific. And so even though all of these individually can be great starting points, in the long run, checking multiple places or with additional strategies is a useful complement to the online databases themselves. Um, a second approach can be looking for internal funding. And a helpful way of thinking of internal funding is that any college or university is, a, is basically composed of multiple sub-organizations within it. So there's your home department, there's your graduate program, if that is structured differently than your home department itself. There can be research centers on campus, any sort of campus group. So say, for example, there's a postdoctoral association, if there is our graduate student government organizations, even things like, say, student disability services. Um, if there is an, so say, for example, if an organization like that offers small scholarships to undergraduate students or graduate students who also have a disability, um, even though the scope of the eligibility may not directly relate to you know, the teaching, that can be another source that if your identity overlaps, that can be a potential area of overlap. And so um, thinking as broadly as possible about any organization
organization that might have a connection to you can be a great way to fill in some of these smaller scale awards that would be less likely to list it in the broader databases. Now that said, because these are all campus specific, the biggest disadvantages are that it's entirely going to depend on whether your school offers something like that. Um, and so, unfortunately, there really isn't a shortcut around this other than just looking as broadly as possible within the um, different organizations on campus, which, depending on your institution, may be easier or harder than others, um, depending on how the information is organized. So the example that I have up here is you know, a University of Iowa example where um, there's a page called the Directory of Centers and Institutes, which is essentially a compilation of all of the different centers. So uh, like the Center for Biocatalysis or uh, the Center for Teaching, things like that. And it's a pretty comprehensive list, which if there's an analogous type of list um, at your institution's homepage, it might just have to be an A to Z list. Um, the interface for it may be easier or harder depending on the web organization, but uh, this can be another valuable place to look. And then the final strategy is communication. And um, I titled this like communication rather than networking because the term networking can often have uh, um, you know, different connotations to people. It can sometimes sound stressful. But rather than thinking of it in terms of um, you know, something stressful, think of it more as just reaching out, asking a question to somebody. Um, have you heard of um, any funding opportunities related to teaching? Or say if it's an icebreaker at a conference or an event, what's the most obscure funding opportunity that you've heard of? So things like that, um, whether it be very specific or whether it's open-ended, that could be a good way to, again, learn about more niche opportunities, things that are not necessarily always going to be as likely to be listed in an online database, but could be extremely relevant to people within your research field or within the broader circle of uh, scholars who have a strong emphasis on being very engaged with teaching. And places to look for people can be anywhere that there are people you can interact with. So whether at your institution, through CERTL events, uh, conferences in person, people in your program, um, online professional organizations, essentially anywhere that you look, even if the very first person that you ask, say this person here in orange in this diagram, say if you're the green person and ask the orange person, even if they don't initially know of any tangible resources, if they're able to refer you to three people who might have a good idea of something to ask for, um, all it takes is for one of them to know something tangible, be able to connect you to another person. And so this can be a really rich reservoir of information that you would not necessarily easily receive from other sources, and also a way to combine getting information recommendations about funding opportunities with advice about, say, if they previously applied for it or previously been funded. So the disadvantage, of course, is that it's inherently unpredictable if any given person will know something tangible. But that said, because it's so idiosyncratic, um, the more that you start um, just reaching out, um, even if it's just asking a simple question, that can be a way of increasing your chances of potentially finding somebody who does know something. Um, and basically, by doing so, even if you aren't necessarily in a setting where my colleague Jennifer Title at the Graduate College at the University of Iowa often calls a culture of application, even if you don't initially know very many people in person who are really aware of different teaching related funding activities, uh, of even encouraging graduate students to apply for funding, uh, whether large scale or small scale, um, uh, by the act of participating in today's event, uh, reaching out and connecting, we're already helping to build that sort of culture of application. So basically anywhere where you would feel comfortable reaching out to someone, asking questions, and continuing the discussion about the funding search. So with that, um, we are at 129, and um, I want to give people a chance to have any remaining questions that you may have about any of the topics today, or particularly about some of these search strategies.
And while people are talking, I'm just going to quick check through the conversation that happened about uh, in the chat window. Okay. Okay, and so it looks like if you haven't had a chance to look in the chat window, there's also been some good conversations there related to um, early career researchers building a stronger track record, specifically through early career grants, um, and then also um, advice about um, how to simplify the IRB process, um, as well as some different strategies about um, being active in looking for different things. Okay, so for the questions that are coming in here, um, how to approach people about funding opportunities in a balanced way, uh, so not being too needy versus not reaching out at all. So that is definitely a question that comes up with any sort of um, interaction with people. Um, I would say to, um, you know, depending on the setting, if there's a way to ask in um, a relatively casual way, um, another approach can also be to sort of start with whatever you can do on your own first, such as through an external funding database, looking on your own to sort of establish to them, here are the places I've checked so far, are there any additional resources or strategies that you might recommend? So that can be a way to help establish both the reason why you're asking out to them, but also to show that um, you are also you know, being considerate of their time and also balancing some of the initiative. Um, and so the other component of that also can be, um, say, if it's somebody that you have other topics that you might want to ask them about, um, setting up a brief meeting time. If there are multiple topics, just asking all at once, say, if you're worried about, am I contacting them too often? Um, so there are multiple considerations there, but those are some of the first things that come to mind there. OK. Um, so for the question about specific search term keywords, how specific to your discipline or project topic to be? So the specificity of your keywords is essentially, so it's sort of the analogy of a double-edged sword in the sense that if you're very specific, it can be beneficial in the sense of ensuring that the results you get are very closely related. However, being too specific can mean that you're excluding results that would have been relevant but did not use that exact phrasing. So um, say, for example, um, mathematical versus mathematics or math might give you different results, even though conceptually those are very similar. Most of the keyword search engines are not always very good at generalizing from one term to another. And so um, in general, searching more broadly, um, so things like, say, for that example, like mathematics, math, um, by career stage, say graduate, postdoctoral, um, uh, in general, using slightly broader terms can increase your chances of uh, finding results. So for another example, um, say something like the American Association of University Women, because it's open to all disciplines, you may or may not necessarily find that by just typing in mathematics if the way they phrase it in their text description is um, scholars across all disciplines. Um, and so usually, like say for doing biology searches, I do things like say, like science, biology, uh, alternating with biological, um, graduate, um, say if it would be a particular country that you were looking at doing international research in, um, the name of the country. Um, and so in general, using a pretty wide range of terms, both within your discipline and outside of the discipline, tends to work best. Um, now that said, if using those really general terms gets you too many results to reasonably check, um, it's also OK to you know, start using more specific ones. And then our last question here is, how important is it if a graduate student has a teaching and research fellowship in their resume? Um, and is that related to being more competitive for academic jobs? And so a lot of that will depend on the particular type of academic job that you're looking at. And so um, a lot of, say, you know, R1 institutions with um, doctoral research at the highest activity levels um, 
a lot of times their highest priority in hiring tenure track faculty members is going to be people who have a really strong research program. Um, and so in a case like that, the Teaching as Research Fellowship might not be as critical of a deal breaker. Now that said, any sort of position that's very teaching emphasis, that would be a really good demonstration of that long-term commitment. So um, a single Teaching as Research Fellowship, um, if it's small scale for your project, might not have as much impact as like say a really large national fellowship, but collectively you can absolutely contribute to that overall um, career impression of you as somebody very strongly committed to teaching. Okay, so uh, we went a little bit over time here answering people's questions, but thank you very much for asking them and thank you for participating. And the slides, um, excuse me, the chat window has the link to the slides and um, we'd really appreciate it if you would uh, fill out the survey to let us know what were some things that worked well, um, if you'd be interested in similar types of events in the future, if there's anything that could have helped this event be more effective. So thank you very much everyone for participating and have a great rest of your day.